I farm so hard, the employees wanna find me. And then wanna hire me. What's 100k to a guy like me? Could you please remind me? Farm so hard, this ain't easy. Working late nights, you best believe me. My grades can only go ace. Never wanna see another B unless I'm Jay-Z. Farm so hard, let's get paid. What's good, fans? Your host, Jim Pruitt, aka Farm Danny ED, and I'm bring you another episode of the Farm So Hard podcast. And of course, I have another special episode for you guys today. We're going to be talking about something that a lot of you guys are doing and you probably wish you had a little bit more guidance from, but of course, I'm not going to be doing all the talking today. I have some phenomenal guests to come and talk about procedural sedation. And this is going to be a really cool episode. We're going to talk about some of the, the physician side of things, some of the nursing side of things, and some of the pharmacy side of things. We're going to combine all of this together so when you're riding into work today, if you get a procedural sedation, you know exactly what to do. But I'm going to go ahead and pass it over and let my guests introduce themselves, and we're going to jump right into this episode. Uh, hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Quinn Cummings. I'm one of the uh, adult and pediatric uh, emergency medicine physicians at the Medical University of South Carolina. I did my training uh, residency in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana at LSU, and then I came to do uh, my emergency, uh, pediatric emergency medicine and uh, ultrasound uh, fellowships, um, actually both of them. Uh, here at MUSC. Hey there, I'm Ben Jackson, one of the pediatric emergency physicians here uh, as well. I um, grew up here in Charleston, uh, did my training uh, at the University of Alabama, Birmingham in uh, pediatrics and then in pediatric emergency medicine and have been back uh, as an attending uh, here in the MUSC Children's Emergency Department since 2009. All right, perfect guys. So you know we like to jump right into it, not tons of fluff. So I want to ask these guys a few questions, but I just want to get right into what are the most common indications for procedural sedation, particularly in the ED. And I want to caveat this where you may have some more common things that happen for adults, and you may have some things that's more common for your pediatric patients. So let, let me know about that. So at least on the adult side, I'd say Probably the most common would be fracture reduction, overwhelmingly going to be some orthopedic injury, um, whether that's a glenohumeral dislocation, whether that's a both bone forearm reduction. Um, those are probably our most common uh, ones that we see there. Um, I don't know, Ben, probably in kids, you know, we do more, um, I feel like, laceration repairs under uh, procedural sedation or at least some kind of um, pharmacologic facilitation um, for more minor procedures in, uh, in kids. You know, we do a lot of angiolysis, I think, too, um, For sure. in, in, in pediatrics, but procedural sedation in kids is a little bit, little bit different indications. Yeah, for sure. A lot of orthopedic injury that we care for as well. But, uh, but kids just in general, the younger the child especially, uh, the more difficulty that uh, patient is going to have understanding what's going on, uh, navigating the distress and anxiety that um, a painful condition or a, a procedure that uh, the patient needs to be still for or, um, or undergo uh, that would be otherwise distressing in addition to potentially painful. So, so certainly um, uh, orthopedic injuries, but a lot of laceration repairs, sometimes burn debridements in the emergency department setting. Um, uh, certain examinations uh, under sedation, um, uh, ophthalmologic, um, sometimes uh, in the setting of uh, uh, sexual assault uh, evaluations, um, as well as uh, uh, lumbar punctures, uh, things basically that, that maybe an adult patient could understand and, and navigate a little more um, uh, a little more feasibly without pharmacologic facilitation, but, but kids just need a little, little extra help. Yeah, I've had a few other rare procedures too that um, that I've had to use the procedural sedation for. So um, foreign body uh, for removal sure. in kids, nasal foreign body, um, ear foreign body, especially in uh, patients with developmental delay that simply won't tolerate um, even an exam uh, to do that. Um, in adults, we do cardioversion uh, with uh, metomidate, used often the uh, drug of choice that we use there, but uh, not as common that we get to do that, but another sort of rare procedure that we get to do with a little bit of a pharmacologic facilitation. So like everything goes a little better with some with some medications. But if I, if I understand what you guys are saying, we're going to have to break this down to like the main uses. Uh, a lot of it's going to be relieving either fear or anxiety, uh, providing the need for analgesia, uh, either providing some type of amnesia for an unpleasant procedure, and then facilitating timely optimal outcomes for the procedure. And then lastly, just providing a standard of care uh, now respected and then appreciated by most patients. It just makes this a nicer, easier, and when you're doing pediatric patients, the entire thing is like they expect a lollipop at the end. So um, procedural sedation from a drug standpoint is a chemical lollipop. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to move into like this next, the next step. 
um, and talk about something that's probably a little bit more controversial, level of sedation and analgesia. Uh, it's to the point to where what you call each level can be controversial. So I wanted to kind of go into that and if you want to, you know, specify from an ED standpoint, what some things, uh, anesthesia standpoint, what are some different levels of sedation and where should we be targeting these patients? Yeah, a lot of these uh, levels are uh, carry definitions that, that make sense uh, in the abstract, but at the bedside, there's uh, a lot of fluidity between one state uh, to the next. Uh, there's also some, uh, some policy and oversight implications uh, to the various levels uh, that are defined, uh, and those also factor into how patients are, are monitored and how procedures are staffed. So uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists rec recognizes minimal sedation or anxiolysis, uh, a drug-induced state in which patients respond normally to verbal commands, although cognitive functions and coordination may be impaired, ventilatory and cardiovascular functions are generally unaffected. Uh, these patients generally just uh, ha have a little bit of the edge taken off, they're sort of chilled out, and, um, and, and they uh, uh, probably at most re require uh, pulse oximetry monitoring. Uh, as you move up a little, a little uh, further into the spectrum, uh, moderate sedation or analgesia, formerly called conscious sedation. This is a drug-induced depression of consciousness during which patients respond purposefully to verbal commands alone or accompanied by light tactile stimulation. Reflex withdrawal from a stimulus is not considered a purposeful response. No intervention uh, for maintenance of a patent airway and spontaneous ventilation, uh, no intervention should be necessary to maintain a, a airway patency and spontaneous ventilation should be uh, adequate and expected. And generally speaking, cardiovascular function is, is always maintained. I will say that a lot of uh, what gets done um, in, uh, in, in certain clinical settings is, is termed moderate sedation. Uh, really what we, what we uh, don't want to say, at least in kids, uh, is a purposeful response to verbal commands for most of our procedures, right? Uh, kids are, are, are scared, they're, um, they're uh, in pain, and we're doing painful things to them or we're needing them to be quite still. And so moderate sedation, as, uh, as I've covered, just really doesn't get them uh, to a point where we can do the proper procedure. Now Ben, when you say moderate sedation, you mean conscious sedation, right? Uh, yeah, I think it an, an, uh, has been labeled an oxymoronic term, uh, conscious sedation <laughs> that has no place in the nomenclature. Not a, uh, not a, leading, que not a leading question at all. Correct. <laughs> uh, uh, the uh, American Society of Anesthesiologists also recognizes deep sedation analgesia. Again, a, a, a deeper state of sedation, uh, a drug-induced depression of consciousness during which patients cannot be easily aroused but respond purposefully after repeated or painful stimulation. Right? These patients are, are uh, significantly depressed in terms of their um, in terms of their responsiveness to us, but but painful uh, uh, stimulation should elicit response, purposeful response from them. Um, we would expect uh, these patients who are deeply sedated to maintain ventilatory function independently, uh, though we need to be prepared to intervene uh, should that uh, slip away. Uh, these patients may require some um, some assistance and maintenance of airway patency and could potentially uh, require positive pressure ventilation uh, if they uh, progress a little more deeply um, into their uh, depression of consciousness. We would expect their cardiovascular function uh, to be adequate, though though a bit more impaired uh, than in, than in uh, lesser sedation states. Um, but, uh, but deeper sedation, or deep sedation rather, is, is a really a, a, a more dangerous state that I think uh, your emergency medicine uh, physicians and staff should be comfortable caring for patients in this state, certainly competent to, uh, uh, with the skills necessary to, to um, uh, deliver deep sedation and to, to rescue patients who, who have any untoward events uh, from it, uh, but, it's, but it's a state that should be treated with, with a high degree of respect. Yeah, and you know, going one step further than this, um, obviously, is general anesthesia, and that's not what we, not what we do um, in the emergency department. At least, certainly not on purpose. <laughs> I would mention finally a, a, a state of sedation that has, is somewhat controversial in terms of who recognizes it uh, and how it gets classified. But dissociative sedation, as rendered by the dissociative agent ketamine. Ketamine. Uh, really uh, uh, adored by emergency physicians, particularly those providing procedural sedation care to, to pediatric patients, um, or growing perhaps in its uh, in its use in adults, um, with some uh, with, with some co-administration of other agents perhaps. But nevertheless, ketamine will induce a trance-like cataleptic state. 
characterized by profound analgesia and amnesia, while protective airway reflexes are maintained, spontaneous respirations occur, and cardiopulmonary stability is preserved. This facilitates moderate to severely painful procedures, as well as a relative immobilization uh, for patients who are otherwise uncooperative. I will say ketamine uh, in this dissociative state of sedation from a responsiveness standpoint almost behaves like general anesthesia but from a cardiopulmonary stability standpoint is uh, akin to minimal to moderate sedation so it, it I, we would argue in the emergency medicine uh, side that it that it warrants its own state of classification uh, others uh, with with some different perspectives and different contexts may uh, may contend with us that it's either uh, moderate or deep and this is the use of the drug ket I mean, am I, am I saying that correctly? Can't wait. It sounds familiar. <laughs> All right, guys. So now that we know the different levels of sedation and the more common reasons that we do it for both adult and for pediatric, can you help us prepare for procedural sedation? Because you probably need some equipment, some people, and just get the entire mindset ready to do this procedure. So anytime I'm uh, going any deeper than anxiolysis. Um, I try to prepare for um, what would happen if the patient accidentally slips into the next deeper uh, level of sedation. Um, and so I sort of try to take that cognitive step prematurely and uh, just to get just to get ready for anything that could happen, even though the, the likelihood of, it, of, of a patient accidentally slipping into the next level of sedation with the dose of medication that we use is so low and it's also so infrequent that we have to be conscientious about that and prepare already so that we're um, just so that we're ready that's sort of what we do in the er is you know we don't play to win we play you know not to lose um i think um so so what i do is is i basically prepare to intubate every single patient i go through each one of the steps in my mind I do the same exact setup as if we're going to do a rapid sequence intubation. Um, and, and not only that, but other forms of resuscitation that could presumably occur secondary to these agents, whether that's a patient becoming, um, you know, hypotensive or, um, you know, hypoxemic, obviously. Basically any conceivable emergency that could possibly arise from this, go through every step of what happens next to reverse this or correct this or mitigate this in, in some way. Um, so I personally use the soap me uh, mnemonic. Probably the, pr probably the best way is to actually use a checklist where when you're doing the, uh, the timeout prior to the procedure with the, uh, either the nurse that's documenting the sedation or um, the resident or whoever else is with you, pharmacy, you know, everybody in the room that's going to be present during the sedation and, and having a checklist and going through each uh, piece of equipment and personnel that might be necessary. Um, I'll say that I don't personally use that. I just use the, the soap me and I haven't had any untoward events. Not that that's, you know, the right way to go about thinking things. That just happens to be uh, my practice. Um, so uh, we'll run through soap me um, real quick. S uh, stands for uh, suction. So I usually have two suction canisters going. Um, a, a rigid suction catheter. I don't have a flexible suction catheter unless it's a, uh, a really young kid um, that we're doing. And speaking of which, I don't usually sedate less than maybe three or six months, sort of depending on um, what the indication is. Um, o uh, is for oxygen from all, you know, going down from nasal cannula to uh, non rebreather. Um, of course, um, a bag valve mask um, and, you know, an oxygen uh, tanks and wall oxygen. Uh, really all sorts of supplies there um, ready to go. Um, in terms of airway, I uh, go all the way down from uh, superglottic or extraglottic devices like a laryngeal mask airway. Probably actually would be my first go-to um, since it's so easy to pop them in um, and just assist with ventilations, but I have all of the equipment ready to take the airway all the way down to laryngoscope blade, um, stylet, um, ET tube, you know all of the all of the steps that go into that checking the uh, the bulb of the uh, the cuff rather of the ET tube to make sure all the way into as if I'm going to intubate this patient um, and just kind of go through that step by step so that um, logistically and spatially I'm sort of aware of 
every step that could potentially be made. And I run through that in my head so that that cognitive leap has already been made. Um, P, so um, I, I use a couple different things for P. So one is position. Um, and so that's where, you know, a couple towel rolls, basically gear to sternal notch, same standard position that we use in adults and kids. Um, other things that I uh, include in P are, so the uh, pharmacy, so basically the drugs that we, that we use there, um, including reversal agents if needed. Um, and then the other RSI meds um, in case, especially with ketamine, you know, going down the laryngospasm route where um, patients are potentially gonna need to be paralyzed. Um, and so drawing up the medication, not, necessar not necessarily drawing up the medications fully, but at least calling out the doses um, thinking about those those steps in my head so that I can already, you know, when that untoward event happens, because, you know, if you do enough of these, it will happen, then I'm totally ready, the team's ready, no one's surprised, no one's upset, you know, because that's a, that's a really high stress moment in something that we do so commonly. Um, and people are gonna think, oh, this was a failure, when in reality, it's not, it's actually a success, you know, if you prepare appropriately for that. Um, so next, uh, we do monitors. So that's, you know, obviously putting the patient on a pulse ox and a non-invasive blood pressure cuff. Um, in tidal CO2, so the waveform capnometer. I don't ever really use um, a calorimetric device. I just, you know, I wanna know what the waveform looks like. I wanna know what the number is. Um, and then uh, we usually do a three lead um, ECG, uh, continuous ECG monitoring. And then um, rest of the equipment um, sort of that we have, um, like syringes and needle stuff to draw up. Um, our, our, uh, our medications. Uh, just uh, to reiterate some of what, what Quinn uh, has, has alluded to, these are rare events uh, should, it, should an untoward event occur, um, and yet they're very high stakes, right? So you have to be vigilant um, and, and sort of make the cognitive leap that he has uh, mentioned, uh, uh, assuming that they will occur when in reality they're, they're highly unlikely to occur, but, but uh, uh, almost for certain the time when you're unprepared will be the time uh, when you most need uh, that bag valve mask or that um, uh, reversal agent or the succinylcholine or something uh, that your patient's going to need. If you're not ready and prepared uh, to provide uh, the necessary level of support and response to your patient, uh, you'll, you'll struggle and, and may do your patient uh, harm by not being uh, uh, able to rescue. All right, so it seems like we got to a lot of the preparing for this, and I know a lot of the pharmacists sit here, dude, what about the drugs? This is the star of the show. <laughs> you know, maybe. I think that's one of the things we want to look at, and before we get into talking about individual drugs, I just want to caveat, like, what are we actually looking for here? We're looking for like the ideal agent. We want a few things to happen. We want to produce this angiolysis that we're talking about, and even during like painful procedures, we want to make sure we do that, uh, produce a predictable state of sedation. Um, for the given doses and minimal effects on airway and cardiopulmonary status. I want to emphasize that again. This is a big player when it comes to what we're doing. We want to have a predictable degree of sedation. That's going to be phenomenal to make sure you don't have that airway compromise or the blood pressure issues that we can have. Uh, then, then from there, uh, again, I want to produce the amnesia for the procedure, uh, produce no interactions with any other agents that they can use, and also want to do something that's most likely reversible. So that's going to be key as well, but not necessarily all the time. And then from there, can be administered painlessly, and it's titratable, it has a rapid onset, short duration, and a rapid recovery. So all these things you want to just put in your, in your bowl, and if you guys heard the Brain of Bane song, I'm talking about my secret sauce, my secret sauce to procedural sedation is going to be something that can hit all of these points. So those are the things that I'm, I'm looking for. Is there anything that I'm missing that you guys would probably recommend for if you can make you can make your own drug and you know be big pharma for a second? What would it be? Well, I think the question is, what is the ideal uh, procedural sedation agent, and why is it ketamine? <laughs> why is it ketamine every time? Uh, no, I think you know probably for me. Um, and for my patients, you know, more importantly, it's going to be tailored to um, who is my proceduralist. So if I'm the sedationist, who is my proceduralist? What is my patient? What spectrum of the disease are they are they in? How what's the du estimated duration of procedure and what contraindications do they have? Yeah. You know, um, I know for a long time propofol um, had a contraindication for egg allergy. I I, I'm, I don't know if that's still the case anymore um, but I remember that was for a while um, 
I always thought it was lactose intolerance, but I think that's just because it looks like milk. <laughs> I think the Lexicomp pharmacist will say that, but I think we've now got more data right. that say that that's not necessarily right. the case. And for what we're trying to do, it's not really a big deal. Right. And also, obviously, you know, take into um, account vital sign abnormalities. Of course, at that point, I'm probably taking a step back and saying, hey, is a procedural sedation appropriate? Yeah. For this patient, you know, that's probably um, another cognitive um, sort of checkpoint that I have is because I love doing procedural sedation. I also love doing regional anesthesia. Yeah. Obviously, you know, that was the last uh, podcast that I was on was talking about regional anesthesia. And for both of those, I have to take a step back and say, I know I love to do this. I know that it might make this patient's stay in their emergency department more enjoyable, but is this what's safe? Yeah. Is this what's best for this patient? Is there a more appropriate setting? Is there um, a more appropriate time for this to happen? You know, is this emergent? Yeah. Is this urgent because if it's not truly emergent and any untoward event happens I mean I'm on the hook yeah. for that and I would feel bad too because yeah. you know I want what's best for my patients I think this is a, a critical point to emphasize we wear a lot of hats in the emergency department uh, proceduralist sedationist but we should never take off our risk stratificationist hat we should always keep in mind that what we do involves some measure of risk every time we do anything um, uh, prescribe a drug or not uh, discharge a patient or, or admit the patient um, but entering into a, a procedural sedation encounter uh, is very much um, uh, involves risk that, that we need to be willing to, to identify and then and then to navigate so I think uh, like like Quinn says uh, we love doing this I find it to be among the most tangible means of, uh, of rendering compassionate care is helping um, really uh, uh, not just the patient but the patient's caregivers parents through a really terrible day they didn't plan for. They came to see me today because something bad happened uh, to them, uh, to their child, uh, and then uh, obviously to, to the family unit. And we've got to help them through that. And it's really a huge privilege to be able to provide compassionate care in this regard. But I don't want to add to their, uh, their burden by uh, doing things in a risky manner. Yeah, and I think because the, po the potential adverse consequences of a procedural sedation down to anoxic brain injury, right? That because that's really would be the worst possible outcome, you know, anoxic brain injury death. Obviously extraordinarily rare, but that is the theoretical worst. That's why probably the safest um, the, the safest way to approach it is to be a dedicated sedationist and have a dedicated proceduralist. Now this is really in an in an ideal world and I think um, the reality in a lot of community uh, emergency departments is that um, the emergency physician doesn't have a massive team to come uh, assist with uh, the sedation and the procedure itself. Um, and they're usually the ones performing the sedation as well as performing the procedure. And um, that can be uh, fraught with, I think, medical legal risk, but you know, that, that, that is the reality um, for um, a lot of patients um, that uh, undergo procedural sedation in the emergency department in the United States. All right, guys, we're going to just go through piece by piece and look at each of these drugs. And I'm going to hit the, the high notes of dosing and things of that nature. Then we can really talk about the, the, the advantages and disadvantages of those drugs. So I think the first one that starts off is the more common agent of propofol. That's going to be the one that most people are very, very uh, familiar with. And uh, for, forgive my French, but sometimes we call it a little Jackson juice, you know, hard <laughs> uh, But it's something that we, we, we think about as being the first. Dosing is actually an interesting thing. So we say, the dosing on paper is one to two milligrams per kilogram. And I would argue that that's the total dose that we would probably start off with, with additional. So my preference, and you guys can chime in on this, I like to do 0.5 mix per cake syringes and go from there. Start off with 0.5, see how things go. I've had a patient who was completely snowed with 0.5 and had patients that needed 2.5 to get to an adequate amount. But I think starting off on the lower end really helps out quite a bit and then you can continue to titrate and I love propofol for this particular reason. So the dose is like one to two mix per kg overall, but I think we should, when we titrating, I like to do mine in 0.5 increments and I can actually prepare my syringes that way so you guys don't have to think about it. If this is 0.5 every time I give it, if I want to give less, I can. I can get half of that and get 0.25. So when you're doing all of your dosing, you can say, okay, I gave two syringes full. That's one mix per kg. If I gave 
you know, I get four, that's gonna be two meals per day. And it really helps out from when you're training people who don't do it often, or if you're an attending and you're training interns, things of that nature, it really helps out because you start thinking about, you know, this is 22, you know, milligrams, this is 24, you get lost in the sauce, I would say. So it really just help me bring it back and I'll keep control of that. The nursing can keep, keep control of the exact amount and we should we can confirm that prior to getting started. But I think if you know every time I want my syringes in 0.5 meters per kg, this patient's 80 kilos, I, I want 40 milligrams. So I think that's where I go from a dosing standpoint. You got any input on that? I would say, first of all, let me just, uh, I'm not getting paid to do this, but let <laughs> me uh, uh, contend for all of you who may be listening to enlist an ED pharmacist to help you with drug preparation, drug, drug decision uh, making. Uh, it just makes a lot, it just offloads a lot from our uh, our brain. We can think of, um, of indications and potential uh, uh, drugs, but um, but having this level of expertise and uh, and just really just dumbing it down, right? I can't tell you how many times I look at a syringe and say, you know, is this one per kilo or is this half per kilo? That uh, that's a great point that I think um, uh, all of us should should walk away uh, from this podcast with is that um, most of us won't have the benefit perhaps of an ED pharmacist drawing up drugs for us. So it will either be ourselves or an ED nurse or uh, 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 preparing the drugs and then handing us syringes uh, to uh, to deliver. And so so um, that's a great tool um, or or a strategy just to to make sure I know what I'm giving my patient. And really, it only takes uh, one instance of having uh ordering the incorrect concentration uh like the in, in, incorrect formulation that has a different concentration than what you're used to mm-hmm. and drawing it up and just kind of having that sphincter tightening moment of <laughs> i almost gave my patient 10 times as much propofol as they were supposed to receive or 10 times as much ketamine or get a tenth yeah. you know um so making sure you know ha- having an ed pharmacist to double check triple check for something that is as crucial and um, potentially uh, life-threatening um, as an improper or inappropriately dosed uh, procedural sedation. Yeah. So I think as, as we go into talking about the, the onset things that nature, the great thing is that propofol works really fast. The, the textbook and the Lexicomp pharmacist in me, as I'm wearing a not a Lexicomp pharmacist shirt, says that it's going to be 30 to 60 seconds onset. I would argue that for most of my patients, it's going to be like 15-ish, 15, mm-hmm. 15, 20 seconds. Ultra rapid. As soon as you push that, that flush behind it, you're going to see some effect. Um, and then the duration is going to be anywhere from, I think, 5 to 10 minutes. But again, I would argue that if you're giving half of the dose in this mechanism that we're talking about, it's going to be a little shorter. I'm sure. saying 2.5 to 5 minutes once you actually reach the threshold. Right. You have to get there first, then you're going to have that duration. And that's going to be something that we really, really enjoy about Cripple Fall. But I got to talk about the, the nasty effects, the things we have to look for. That's going to be the point of having hypotension and bradycardia. What we don't consider is that Cripple Fall has calcium channel and beta blocker t- properties. And I think once I say that, it's like, oh, I'm giving Dilt and I'm giving Metopo at the same time. It, of course it makes sense. And if we look at data-wise, we're talking about anywhere from close to 20 to 25% reduction in the systolic. So I was to say, what's my systolic blood pressure? Half that a couple of times. Can I tolerate that amount of drop? Mm-hmm. Then it really helps me out as far as thinking about what's going on. And I like to say, I'm not just preparing medication, but that's what I'm assessing as well. When I go to procedure stations where I'm offloading the task of drawing the meds up and checking, I'm also saying, hey, do we have fluids? Do we have any type of you know vasoactive agents as well? Because based off the, the data, based off his patient, he may be more likely to tank than some of the other people. So you have that component as well to, to consider. Uh, it's gonna hurt. So the injection site pain is something that's actually a, a real deal. And these patients, depending on if you're pushing on the same side as they have the injury, you may have a patient actually <laughs> yank their arm and that's the same shoulder you're trying to reduce and it can be discomforting. I think talking to the patient that, hey, it's gonna burn for a few seconds, you're gonna be out. And a second helps them stay still and it helps you not freak out because I've seen people drop the syringe because the patient yanked their arm back and they wasn't prepared for that. Mm. So these are like this little caveats to, to consider when it comes from propofol. Um, the PRIS, the propofol and infusion, uh, propofol related infusion syndrome, that's really a deal with big doses. Yeah. Big doses infusion is for a long period of time. Long time yeah. I know it's more common in the pediatric population and they are <laughs> really focused on it. It is something that you want you, you won't, you'll never start Purple Fall without someone saying the word yep. press. Yep. They're not fans. <laughs> so, so they're not a big fan, but just have that in mind. 
that's something that can happen, but it usually doesn't happen in the ED. It usually doesn't happen with the doses that we're, we're, we're using. So just keep that in mind and don't be a Lexicon pharmacist when it comes to that. Now I mentioned a few of those different things. Can you guys tell me, you know, why propofol is ideal for you guys when being be used for procedural sedation? So I think that, uh, so at, at least for the uh, procedures that I use propofol for, is they're often so short in duration, and uh, the painful or noxious stimulus is going to be so quick on, quick off. Um, those are indications for me um, to to hit propofol. So whether that's um, you know reducing a hip, because you know it uh, probably has some some neuromuscular blocking effects too to cause some uh, some muscle relaxation. Um, or uh, you know nasal foreign body, um, I think is another one that I've that I've used it for with the uh, LMA at the ready because you know nasal foreign body doing a propofol we're looking at apnea as a potential sure. risk and um, using a nasal in tidal CO2 in that situation is not going to be um, amenable um, for this type of sedation uh, just because of the location. So those are ones where you know I sort of have my or like just think a little bit more uh, closely about apnea and you know um, visually monitoring their respiration um, I think which is you know fraught with its own difficulty and um, and caveat with that. Hey, you mentioned earlier uh, among the traits of an ideal procedural sedation agent would be reversibility. Obviously there's no exact reversal uh, agent for propofol but metabolism and time yeah, and, and both those time. being very uh, very quick uh, is a real uh, makes propofol real, a real um, asset to have in our armamentarium but like uh, like quinn said um the withdrawal of that noxious stimulus may render your patient unbalanced in terms of the sedative on board and the uh, the untoward um, uh, cardiorespiratory effects with propofol in particular and then and so you may need to be or you absolutely need to be willing to um, and ready to, to intervene and, and assist the patient uh, until that metabolism has occurred and uh, time reversibility has, uh, has ensued. All right, guys, let's talk about probably most people's favorite drug. I'm not going to pretend I'm not an ED person. I'm not going to pretend that I'm not a ketamine fan. I'm oh, gonna... I thought it was going to be Brevitol. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to pretend that my ID bag doesn't have ketamine on it. I'm not going to pretend any of <laughs> But I'm going to talk very... You know, I'm gonna be I'm gonna try to keep my bias here, but okay, let's talk about ketamine. The dose that we traditionally see is gonna be similar to propofol, one to two mix per kick, and I have the same caveat. I hand the syringes over in 0.5 mix per kicks, and we go from there. Pediatric, you can get into some things like nasal uh, dosing. The dosing is big there, three to nine mix per kick. Again, you're, gonna, you're probably gonna change your formulation when it comes to that. So that's one thing I want to caveat to you guys. There's many, many formulations and concentrations of ketamine. And sure, if you're an ED pharmacist or anyone who helps with stocking the Omnicell, try to limit the amount of concentrations that you have. That's an easy way, especially in a pediatric population, to get more than what you would need. So, of course, we know that from a mechanism action standpoint, ketamine is an intermediate receptor antagonist, so it can unblock a lot of that excitatory component that it, that it needs. And it's unique because it provides this dissociative uh, state and it creates like a trance-like state and causes amnesia in patients and it has analgesia properties. Uh, as far as onset, again, the textbook will say 30 to 40 seconds. Uh, depending on how you're administering it, you may see a quicker effect. And I love the fact that I know my ketamine is working by just looking at their eyes and seeing that nice diagnosis mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay, we're good to go. Sure. Duration can be varied here. Um, I usually see, again, five to 10 minutes once you get to that dissociative dose. And the phenomenal thing about ketamine, you know you're wearing off when the nystagmus goes away. Sure. So that's gonna be a cool thing about this where you can barely time it. So we're looking at purple fall and ketamine, we have similar onsets, similar durations, but again, the caveat and effect that you have to get to that point, that level, the level, the level of sedation that you're looking for, you have to get there first, then you have your duration. So I think some people say, oh, well, it's gonna work for this long, but they never titrate the patient to the adequate amount and they can have some some issues with their, with their procedure. Um, adverse effects, we have to be honest with all of that. You have a dose-related increase in heart rate and blood pressure. This is transient. So keep that in mind. Again, if your patient skyrockets up, if you're doing a chest tube insertion, trauma, don't freak out thinking the patient is bleeding to death because the heart rate spikes. It's just my ketamine. Right. It's no big deal from there. And you can, of course, you can have this increase in, in entropy, which can cause an increase in myocardial oxygen demand. 
Um, the emergent phenomenon is something that I think it freaks the nurse out more than it freaks everyone else out. Uh, it's scary. People yell for a second. They say some cool things, very cool things, and then you go from there. Um, emesis is something that we have to be concerned of. Uh, some people go as far as pre-treating with, uh, with Zofran and some other agents. I don't know if there's any data for that, but again, if it makes you feel better, you know, you, you, you like it, I love it kind of deal. And then the thing that I think the scariest component is the laryngeal spasm. And this is going to be more it's going to be more associated with big concentrations quickly. So if you're slamming your ketamine and you're not giving it over, you know, 30 to 30 seconds to 60 seconds, that's when this can happen. This is one of the things I see commonly done that I try to uh, step in on and say, hey, if you're not prepared for everything, if we, we're just we don't follow the, the procedure, the preparation to the T please make sure you give me your ketamine a little slower because that's a, a way for you to make things more interesting than any of us want. Um, and now I, I enjoy very boring procedures now. Sure. I don't want anything interesting to happen and that's one of the interventions that I say, hey, this is what I'm looking for as well. Can you slow down the administration? I usually hold a phone out, show it to my, my resident or my, my attending and say, hey, you're about 30 seconds in, you're doing great versus it's three seconds. And I've seen that happen. Well, I've sure. seen the window spasm and it's a pretty, disturbing event to happen when you have other things going on. Um, so those are my big things for adverse effects of that nature. Talk to me about the pearls and why you like to use ketamine. And, and we can make a whole episode on this, but let's just talk about the things from, from this procedural station standpoint. Uh, so before I get into the pearls, uh, one of the pitfalls, I think, um, tagging on to what you were saying, Jimmy, um, is that this is a dissociative sedation. It's not a deep sedation. So, especially in, in pediatric patients, I've seen some of them call out for their parents. So, obviously, we try to have the parents leave the room. I never insist, and you know, but I say, listen, your kid might call out for you and cry, and you're going to want to go up and hold their hand, and you're going to be sad about it. But they are in our space. Mm -hmm. They are in Candyland. They that is just an unconscious mechanism that they are exhibiting and that we're witnessing, and it, we're innocent bystanders to that. Mm -hmm. And parents are very I, I used to think that you know for my kids that I'm absolutely going to be present during a procedural sedation if my, you know my kid breaks his forearm or something like that now I'm thinking of course it's free babysitting and I'm out of <laughs> here I'm gonna go you know have a lovely lunch with my wife while you know uh, Dr. Jackson fixes his forearm but um, I think there's a tendency to uh, rush and so seeing a patient um, viscerally react during a procedure or cry out and even though they're fully dissociated the sedationist often wants to or at least the proceduralist often wants the patient to be deeper somehow and that sometimes it's just not possible you know yeah. you can't really get any deeper than completely dissociated yeah. and giving more medication or you know rapidly oh my gosh they're they're moving their body so we want to you know and we're trying to do a closed reduction mm -hmm. now we want to give ketamine hurry up let's draw it up and give it you know there's sometimes you have to take a step back and say, listen, maybe there's, maybe we'll add propofol now. Maybe yeah. this becomes a catafol sedation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or, or, or maybe thinking about giving some um, benzodiazepine during the, something else, you know. It's usually not more ketamine. Yeah. That's the answer. That's sort of whenever you can get into, into, into trouble. Yeah, I would also say uh, with respect to ketamine, as as with propofol, you've mentioned the uh, the respiratory depression and the uh, the potential for hemodynamic suppression with propofol. So you want to make sure those patients are, are optimized instead of in terms of their volume status, uh, that they're they're not like sort of unrecognized sepsis or profoundly uh, volume down or hemorrhagic. Uh, with ketamine, uh, you'd want to make sure your patient doesn't have uh, untreated. Uh, uh, hypertension that, that uh, most of this dose related increase in heart rate and blood pressure is very well tolerated it's like almost clinically insignificant but although you, you might uh, 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 your attention will certainly be drawn to the monitor when you see marked uh, tachycardia um, or, or marked hypertension for a for a very young child let's say um, but but generally speaking it's very well tolerated it's dose dependent and once the kid metabolizes the drug it's gone but you would want to uh, take note of the patient's uh, comorbidities and, and if, uh, uh, if the patient has unrecognized and untreated hyper Tension may want to consider that ketamine it wouldn't be the agent of choice uh, or at least ketamine alone uh, to accomplish the procedure. So uh, things that I do to mitigate some of the uh, expected adverse effects like um, like post-ketamine administration, uh, nausea and vomiting is prior to the procedure whenever I'm uh, consenting the, the patient or consenting the parent 
um, to uh, administer ketamine to their kid. Um, I'll sort of tell them, hey, the first thing you're going to see is this nystagmus where their eyes sort of jiggle side to side, and that's how you know, you know, they're in they're in Candyland, um, and they're not present with us here. Sort of lights are on, but nobody's home. Is your kid an easy puker? Because if they are, we're going to go ahead and administer. And actually, you know, um, on Dancitron. Um, actually has a pretty low number needed to treat. So my understanding is somewhere around nine or 10. Um, so it's pretty much a free shot, but um, I don't do it routinely still. Um, just because of my experience, I really haven't seen too much um, nausea and vomiting. And I think that's probably because our, um, and this is a topic for a whole nother podcast, is our NPO times are, are getting a little bit shorter. And that, that probably has some uh, some effect is, is my, my guess. Um, so I'll ask them, hey, if they're an easy puker, we're going to go ahead and give them some um, some Ondansetron prior to. I'll give them a couple of uh, emesis bags to go home with. I say, listen, keep this in your car. We're going to wait 30 minutes after your kid wakes up and, you know, give them a popsicle. Sometimes they still don't puke until they're in the car. So it's always good to have one, you know, keep one at the bedside table. Keep one, you know, always good to have an emesis bag um, sort of at the ready. In terms of the emergence phenomenon, um, I usually just tell patients what to expect. Say, listen, you're going to trip out. You're gonna have some of the craziest dreams that you've ever had in your life. I would love for you to not have a crazy nightmare and for it to just be a cool, you know, visual trippy dream mm -hmm. that, you know, we laugh about later. Um, that definitely, you know, with kids, there's a lot of sort of uh, familial relationship where the mom has a lot of anxiety that's sort of transferred onto the kids. So sometimes, you know, I'll sort of just read the room mm -hmm. and prophylactically give uh, something for angiolysis. Um, or, you know, control their pain really well prior to, uh, if at all possible. Um, and then whenever they are actually emerging, um, as kids especially, I've, I, I found they'll still have a little nystagmus and they'll kind of have some diplopia, some, some double vision. Having the parents with them as soon as possible afterwards, um, I think helps a lot just with a little bit of reassurance hearing, you know, hearing mom's voice, you know, holding dad's hand, something like that. Um, I think can go a, a really long way um, with with preventing that. Yeah, I would add lights down, really minimal stimulation in that procedural room uh, to allow the kid to transition back to from dissociation to uh, regular wakefulness um, with uh, with caregiver presence, um, reassuring voice. Um, but but yeah, minimizing the stimulation to ensure that that they have um, uh, a smooth transition. Yeah, also, I also try to add a little music into the situation. So uh, if, if patients are awake for uh, the sedation, I let them choose. Um, and that has had mixed results. Um, um, if they're uh, fully dissociated or going into deep sedation, um, I get to choose and I usually do Mozart or something, you know, something relaxing classical music. Um, one other thing uh, that I like to do uh, with uh, ketamine sedations especially is give a, uh, a bit of a, a larger dose off the bat. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, also I'll start 1.5. Mm -hmm. So I don't do one, I go straight to 1.5. Oftentimes I have to redose less. Mm -hmm. They, it just lasts just a little bit longer. You know, I, I start to redose around 15 minutes or so after giving 1.5 mm -hmm. and then I'll give an extra 0.5 or so every 10 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, or I'll add an additional agent like propofol or something like that um, every, 10, 10 minutes or so. But I found that just that initial dose of 1.5 milligrams per kilogram is often enough for the vast majority of especially orthopedic procedures that we do here to last through the reduction, through the, uh, the immobilization and like the, uh, the molding of the splint, especially, which is pretty painful. And then there's sort of, it's nice, call parents back as the x-ray is being done. And you know, it just, it's nice to not have to redose. Yeah. I feel like we reduce a lot of the side effects of, from redosing. One of the things that uh, has been tried or sort of a standard practice when, when ketamine was first introduced into procedural sedation care was co-administration with midazolam. Um, over time, that was shown not to diminish um, uh, with uh, any evidence uh, basis the uh, um, uh, occurrence of the emergence phenomena or an untoward emergence uh, agitation. But, um, but it did show actually some, some benefit to um, diminishing a recovery emesis. So um, I, I have heard um, and have seen uh, plenty of times that the way your patient goes down with ketamine is likely to be the way the patient uh, um, emerges. So um, I do think there is a role uh, for really anxious, agitated kids prior to even being sedated 
to giving a, a bit of midazolam um, in a small dose to try to help um, him or her transition into readiness for being sedated subsequently um, and, and hopes that that patient uh, enters the ketamine dissociative state in a calmer, um, uh, more soothing manner, and then hopefully will emerge in, in a similar uh, calmer manner. All right, guys, so that's gonna be our two big guns. Uh, I will say that benzone and azepines will probably be in the next role, and it's, it's really gonna help you depending on the level of sedation that you want. And I think the agent we use more commonly, and if you have heard any of my other work, I'm a big fan of midazolam when it comes to my benzos, because it really gets the job done for people in the ED. Um, the dosing that we traditionally see is going to be 0.1 mg per kg. Again, you can see some ranges there when we when talking about pediatric patients and if you give an intranasal or not. Again, be conscious of your concentrations. Um, there's a 5 per 1 at my shop and I, ha I have a, a 1 per 1 at my shop. So 1 mg per 1 ml and then I have another one that's going to be a 5 mg per 1 ml. That's something to be conscious of. Most people try to keep one in their in their ED, but I have two, so I think that's something to be prepared for. For small people, it shouldn't be as big of a deal because you're not giving huge doses. But for the adult population, what you're more commonly here, I want two for a set. I want four for a set. And my thing, I think that anywhere from two to five, from an angel lysis standpoint, is a solid dose. Once you start getting bigger than that, I start saying, hey, um, are we prepared for procedural sedation or just is something you want to be you know, just, just to relax them because we're getting we're getting pretty big there with the five of verse that can can knock someone the top of They'll be relaxed. Yeah. They'll be highly relaxed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, relax right. with not breathing, things of nature. So just keep that in mind. Um, pr pretty quick onset. I would say this is probably closer to the textbook. I would say probably one to two minutes. You start to see something by five minutes. They should be nice. Yeah. Uh, nice and calm. And uh, I joke around because it's you know it's a benzo days if you're going to work on a GABA receptor is that. You're basically giving them a nice cocktail of whatever you like, whether you're a tequila person or you're a Jack and Coke kind of person, you're giving them a pretty nice little dose of that and they're really gonna put them back. The do the duration is a little weird. Like in textbook gonna say 30 to 80 minutes, realistically, clinically, I see anywhere from 20 to 60 minutes once you get them to the level they, they need. And of course, from the adverse effects standpoint, we're concerned about respiratory depression and hypotension. Um, you can have patients you know, drop pretty precipitously right in front of you. And then you can have someone who doesn't do much at all and you need multiple repeat doses. So um, for me, I traditionally see my docs ask for midazolam plus fentanyl plus another agent. Um, not necessarily used by itself as often, but that's just one of the agents we see. Can you guys talk about some of the benefits or some different caveats to when you want to use midazolam? So um, on, on the pediatric side, uh, we use a lot of oral midazolam, um, and I usually give about 0.4 to 0.5 uh, mix per kg. Tell parents, you know, it's gonna put your kid about two to three beers deep. I usually get a little chuckle from them. They're like, okay, I get it. That's sort of what we're aiming for. Um, especially with kids, there's, it's multimodal, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there's gonna be some pain control. There's gonna be uh, some angiolysis that occurs. Not, not pain control from the midazolam, right? Because it has no, um, has no analgesia. Uh, associated with it um, but uh, you know, pain control and some other way um, the angiolysis will come from the midazolam um, and a lot of times it's like okay it's a little uh, scalp lacquer, or uh, you know a forehead laceration uh, that needs to be uh, repaired and we'll do some topical anesthetic sort of you know a lot of you know set the mood distraction there's really a lot of it so midaz oral midazolam I feel like is just one piece to a pretty big um, to a pretty big puzzle of um, how best to approach uh, pediatric procedural sedations for, for minor procedures like that. And I will say um, intranasal midazolam has a role as well. It will be a little quicker onset than your, your oral. Uh, the downside to intranasal may be the, the fact that it can be a bit noxious to the nares and so can burn uh, on administration. Um, but utilizing the, the higher concentration for the intranasal route to, to minimize the volume that needs to be given uh, would be a, a key there. Um, but uh, I think uh, midazolam really is an optimal uh, for most kids, um, and, and I only I only do uh, children's emergency work. But for most kids, uh, midazolam is, is an optimal anxiolytic agent. Yeah, and I've heard some advocate for uh, pre-administration of intranasal lidocaine to mm -hmm. reduce the burning. And my experience with kids is like the fewer amount of yeah. squirts in the nose. You know, I don't many how many don't know how many times I've said it's just like a little backward sneeze. And then they're like, you better never do that to me again, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, so I'm sort of one shot and go, just tell them, 
or don't that it's gonna burn <laughs> tell the parents maybe um you know pre-treat the parents more more than anything yeah. i feel like i guess i can say um that lorazepam or ativan most of us would say it's, it's an option again if you just don't have certain stuff in your ed that's something you can be considerate of uh but the dosing which we're going to see for the adult size can be uh one and two mix per kg again i don't really see this used very often at all in the the young pediatrics uh again it could just be my experience and one, one to two mix yeah. total right not mix per yeah kid. one or two mix just for the right, adult side right, right. um and then the the main effects again you're going to see that sedation and retrograde amnesia which you want onset is pretty crappy to me uh, this is when i would say to get what you need it's going to take anywhere from like 10 to 15 minutes um, duration is a lot longer between you know say four to six hours on paper i would probably say it depends on a host of other things you can have a sure. patient very relaxed for a long period of time and mess up your dispo so not an ideal agent for me and you can still have that respiratory depression and hypotension anything that you guys can add on when it comes to um, lorazepam for your procedural sedation patients so i like to use lorazepam um for like oral lorazepam really more than anything um it's usually when i'm doing uh, benzos I'm, I'm actually usually using them um, orally um, as a single dose or um, intravenously uh, with other agents. Um, but I'll do this for like a, a prolonged, like an MRI or something. Like if I'm doing an MRI of the spine, I'm trying to do um, some multimodal pain control for sure. And then patients are usually just anxious being in the tunnel, you know, the loud magnet tunnel that they're, you know, have oftentimes been in before and hate it. And so I try and just give them a little bit, something to take the edge off, you know, keep it angiolysis. I don't go all the way down, you know, with lorazepam. Um, and I find that, that that works pretty well in those kind of situations. Agreed. All right, guys, so the next one we're gonna have on is gonna be your fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl can be a great agent. It's gonna be, provide mostly just analgesia. They can provide a, a, a small level of sedation, but the intent usually is just to provide them a little uh, analgesia. yet. The dosing that you can see is going to be anywhere from 0 0.5 to 1.5 mics per kilogram. Again, I'm saying it again, mics per kilogram. I've got so many PSIs and so <laughs> many reports uh, due to the fact that someone ordered milligrams per kilogram and the EMR system should take care of that, but I think it's something we should just communicate that that can be a deal. So of course you can start some, again, very good, uh, and these different reductions in control of pain. Onset is rather quick. I, I love this. Again, the, the textbook is gonna say one to two minutes realistically. I ask patients about 30 seconds in, it's like, I feel a little different. You know, that, that feels different. And mm -hmm. that's all I, I, I really want from just to kind of bring them down a little bit. Um, duration is gonna be really about 30 to 60 minutes. I would see again for that, once you get them, their, bank, their pain control. So that's gonna be great. And then adverse effects, you have to look for this dose dependent respiratory depression. I'm gonna say this chest wall rigidity or rigid chest syndrome I, i've seen it in a textbook many many times i have yet to find a physician or anyone who's practiced that's seen it's solely due to traditional dosing and administration of fentanyl again that's the board's answer guys um but I, i've been pimped so many times by people who, who's who's given thousands of doses of fentanyl and i'm getting up there now as far as doses i've administered this is not something that i traditionally see or have heard of um uh, but again just to look out for if your patient just stops being able to ventilate well, um, you can just reverse them just like you would for respiratory depression. Mm -hmm. um, we have a phenomenal agent for this, so it's something to consider. Uh, this is another agent that can be given, given intranasal right. as well, so that's going to be a great agent to, to have have on board. So I think this is another cool agent. These I see like one to two yeah. mix, max max per kilo as well for, for that. And again, concentration. I don't see many different ones like ketamine and propofol and midazolam, but again, usually I see the 50 micrograms per ml concentration in most of my shops. So again, this is a really cool agent to have, really works well. Um, yeah, big fan of fentanyl. Yeah, I like to use fentanyl for, um, for abscess drainage, especially the deloculation of, uh, you know, complicated abscesses and the sort of expression of pus out of it. You know, there's, you can put as much uh, topical anesthetic, intradermal anesthetic over an abscess that you're going to lance. And that may help with the initial incision, but the expression of pus is never tolerated well. Yeah. Almost routine, I mean, I don't know of anyone who said, oh, that feels so much better. Thank you for squeezing my armpit, you know, where it's the most tender. You know, that's why I came in is so that you wouldn't touch it. Um, so I use fentanyl for short, super painful procedures. And again, co-administering other medications usually to help 
Um, I've used it a lot for gluteal abscesses, um, you know, polynatal cysts, those kinds of things, where it's like just at an unfortunate location, yeah. which abscesses often are. That's sort yeah. of the, that's how they arise, right? Um, so I've actually done a few um, polynatal abscess drainages that um, with nitrous oxide, actually. Um, so it's an inhaled anesthetic that we have available to us on the PEDS side. Um, co-administering with uh, either oral morphine or uh, IV fentanyl if it's something that's going to be quicker. Okay. I'll say on the children's side, uh, most kids fear needle sticks more than just about anything in the world. And uh, kids who come in with orthopedic injury, and it's not definitively a, a deformed forearm, let's say, but you know it's something that needs uh, an x-ray and it's um, going to require a little bit of uh, different positional manipulation to get the x-ray completed sufficiently. Intranasal fentanyl is, is a wonder drug for that, usually at around a, a 1.5 to 1.7, sometimes even up to 2 mics per kilo uh, to accomplish that, depending on um, the, the degree of, of distress and pain that the child is experiencing and the size of the child, right? I would probably max out, I, I don't think I would go up to 100 micrograms uh, total dose. I probably would max out somewhere in the 50 to 75 uh, microgram dose. Um, nasally, both from a volume standpoint and from a total dr uh, a drug dose standpoint. But it has great um, uh, benefit to some of our patients who end up just having maybe a buccal fracture who won't need an IV uh, and, and procedural sedation to get that managed. They just are gonna need a splint applied. So um, you may spare a lot of kids some needle sticks by utilizing fentanyl as an intranasal agent. All right, the next one is gonna be a, a really interesting drug, Atomidate, and I think we've seen this used a little bit more recently. And I love Atomidate for many reasons, but I think we should talk about dosing wise. I always say half dose Atomidate. And that dose is gonna be anywhere from 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 uh, mix per gig. And some people even, for our adult patients, for the average size patient, they say, oh, give me up seven to 10 of Atomidate, but I think we should really just call those things out just to make sure the main effect is gonna be some um, sedation and it's gonna have some GABA, GABA receptor modulation as well. Onset is rather quick. Again, this is where the text we actually get to right about 10 to 20 seconds. And the duration is rather short being three to five minutes. So this is gonna be great for a very quick thing to do. Uh, some things to look out for is this adrenal suppression. And the data is very, very controversial whether that means anything. We do know the numbers do become abnormal. Yes, does that do anything for your patient? Probably not. For the people that we're doing this on, definitely not gonna be a big deal. Um, but something just to keep in, 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 in respect. Uh, the myoclonus reaction is a real deal. Now, you can definitely have this type of, uh, it looks like posturing. If, if, if you mm -hmm. give it for the, you know, a certain patient, you get freaked out for a second, they step up on you. So not gonna be something I just reach for continuously. And respiratory depression is something to, to look for as well. But from a hemodynamic standpoint, this is a phenomenal agent. You're not gonna have much of anything happening when it comes to heart rate, blood pressure, and things of that nature. So what, when do you allow guys like to throw this into your cocktail? I, I only use this for um, for cardioversion, yeah. for for electrical cardioversion of, of patients, um, mostly because all the other indications that um, have you know it could potentially be used for, I'm going to propofol. Yeah. You know, and in uh, patients where the hemodynamics are a little bit tenuous, I just stick with Atomidate. I've used it for every pharmacological or uh, every uh, electrical cardioversion that I've had. Yeah. And, and I've had excellent success with it. And so for me, if it's not broke, why would I try and fix it? Yeah. I would say, uh, uh, I can't even recall giving it uh, in a pediatric patient. Um, there were some, uh, during my training 15 plus years ago now, uh, hard to believe, um, I saw some of this uh, in the adult emergency department, but would defer to Quinn for present day um, utilization of Atomidate. We still use it obviously in the setting of rapid sequence intubation, but that's beyond the scope of this podcast. Yeah. Something that's newer that's been coming about, and I haven't had the chance to use it yet, is the use of dexamethotomidine or Presidex. Um, some people are given it as an IV push of, of one mic per kilo over 10 minutes, and then intranasal, this is be something they can use of one to 2.5 mics per kilo. Um, again, something that I'm not too big on. I don't have uh, Presidex sticks down the stairs, I only have the drips. Uh, something that, again, it's just, I've, hear, I've heard it, uh, it just, it's for me, it just takes too long. If I'm gonna follow the directions of giving something over 10 minutes, that defeats the purpose. Um, so, but just going through the basics, gonna have some um, sedation and analgesia components. The onset's gonna be within, the textbook's gonna say 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, probably the push gonna get you a little closer than that, but still not favorable for me. In the duration, gonna be right from five, five to eight minutes. So if something takes longer for me to push than it, than it takes to work, <laughs> Right. It's just not going to be uh, ideal for me. The bradycardia and hypotension are two things to look for. But interestingly enough, you can actually have the opposite occur. 
of having hypertension and tachycardia due to just this paradoxical effect that traditionally happens with the bolus more commonly. But again, something that I'm not very familiar with, I've never done this, and I'm pretty sure someone's gonna look at me like, Jimmy, you just don't know what you're missing, and it, it's not given that way. Please message me or tweet me or something and tell me how you guys use this because this is not something that I'm familiar with and for the most part, I haven't needed to do this. So I don't know if you guys have ever used Presidex in your population, I'm mostly adult, but I would love to have someone else talk about it. Um, I, I have not used it. Um, it certainly uh, makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. uh, in practice to have um, a nice smooth, you know, centrally acting alpha two um, agonist. Um, seems pretty elegant. You know, I've had some of my ICU colleagues, PICU uh, adult ICU colleagues, um, who use it regularly, not only for um, like long sedation for like patients that are on, uh, that are intubated and on, on ventilators and, um, you know, sparing propofol, I think is probably uh, the most common reason, you know, indication for it, uh, at least in the ICU setting, uh, from what I've heard from some of my colleagues, but haven't personally used it. Um, I'm certainly guilty of being an early adopter of about any cool new uh, medication uh, for better or for worse. So um, I guess I'll look for that coming down the pipeline and, and you know, uh, see if there are some patients that might benefit from it. Uh, on the pediatric side, I will say uh, again, um, uh, the intranasal use of dexmedicomidine at around uh, two mics per kilo seems to be well tolerated in terms of uh, the noxiousness of its standpoint. So it's so it's uh, reported to be not nearly so uh, dis uh, uncomfortable as um, as uh, intranasal midazolam. Um, it does take probably 20 minutes or so to see um, a, a desired uh, level of, of uh, anxiolysis and sedation reached with that dose. Um, but it's uh, it's been done um, uh, in settings in which time is not of the essence, right? So if you have time to apply uh, some uh, lidocaine, epinephrine, and tetracaine um, gel to a laceration and give um, uh, an intranasal dose of dexmedetomidine and ensuring that you can get the patient um, on the monitor, um, uh, at least the pulse ox uh, during that time, um, uh, to allow those medicines uh, to work uh, in synergy, um, uh, I guess not pharmacologic synergy, but, but allow those medicines to work simultaneously to get your patient in a state of readiness for a laceration repair, let's say. Um, uh, alternatively, similar doses uh, being used for, uh, for some imaging procedures. It, it's been uh, reported to be beneficial, but again, in my daily practice, uh, we're not using uh, dexmedetomidine, and so uh, I would defer to the intensivists and, uh, and outside the OR, outside the ER sedation service uh, for the use of dexmedetomidine. I'm just gonna mention mexohexatol solely due to the fact that it's, a, it's an older agent that I've seen used in some, my previous shop for, as far as their, their um, kits. So many times you have places that have kits for procedural sedation, this is something that was there. Um, again, just for, if someone is out there using it, please let me know. Uh, dosing, we're gonna talk about anywhere from 50 to 100 milligrams for an adult patient with around uh, 70 milligrams average. They may push rather slowly over like, like every 10 milligrams over like five seconds, so probably over a minute or so. And then for the pediatric patient, the, the textbook's gonna say to give intramuscular anywhere from 6.6 .6 to 10 mg per kg. Um, administer as this 5% solution. Again, this is something that I have not used, something that I don't see often, and I've actually dismantled a physical kit that had this in there for a virtual kit solely because of the fact that we've never used it. So uh, something that's not really big for me, main effect's gonna be a really potent hypnotic with a GABA, GABA receptor activity and with amnesia anticonvulsive property. Uh, once you actually get it in, it's rather quick onset and, and lasts about 10 to 20 minutes. So I can see why people would use it, but again, uh, some of the adverse effects of hiccup, coughing, muscle twitching, all the things I don't want happening in the middle of a sedation. Sure. Um, but again, something that I haven't used quite quite often, and it's actually probably challenging to actually mix as well because it comes, the one, my, my concentration had a, uh, yet to actually reconstitute it. So all things not ideal for me. I actually, I've used this in my uh, covered wagon out in the uh, battlefield um, <laughs> to, uh, for some of my soldiers um, that are out there um, in the battlefield, my covered wagon, and I use it usually with ether and laudanum mixed together, all in one tincture, um, and just a little drop of red, and you know, with some with some clove oil, and it works really, really <laughs> well for them. They tolerate it really well. <laughs> I have nothing to add. <laughs> All right, guys, we're gonna to get to nitrous with something that, again, I will say that the PU actually population really championed this, and it's something that I've seen their uh, effects of, because I'm not usually involved in this. I just sit back and watch, oh, they, they're just hanging out. They're just having a great old time. And from what the textbook says, you're gonna see anywhere from, from five to six uh, liters per minute. 
and the main effect is going to be that mild uh, sedative and analgesia and it can cause euphoria as well and i think anytime i go and i got my tooth pulled i remember sitting there like wow sure. why worry about my tooth but everything <laughs> feels so great <laughs> and really quick onset and the risk is going to be based off when you turn it off so that's going to be great of course there can be many things that can, that can happen as far as gagging coughing hypotension it may be an asthma attack, but again, I'm not gonna say I'm an expert when it comes to this because it's not drug related. But can you guys give me a little bit more on, on nitrous? Because again, you guys both have seen quite a bit of this. Yeah, nitrous oxide is a, is a really old, um, I guess agent would be the, the reasonable uh, term to describe uh, what this does. It accomplishes uh, anxiolysis quite nicely. Um, and you can get patients sort of maybe moderately sedated in, in a true sense, um, as opposed to a lot of the other procedural sedation agents that we've discussed. Um, it is a, a drug that uh, that is nice to have in your armamentarium, but it's a little bit um, it's a little bit labor intensive in terms of the setup. Uh, having having a flow meter um, wheeled into the room in addition to your standard uh, sedation setup, and then um, and then accomplishing uh, titration during a, a procedure. A lot of folks just without a lot of experience with this um, uh, won't uh, gravitate towards this agent because of the. Uh, the more work for less effect uh, that, that may be uh, the result from, from nitrous oxide. So I find it to be a, a great drug for a super anxious kid that is just not letting anybody come, uh, come near them um, for like an IV placement, um, maybe for some, for some non-facial lacerations. Um, we've actually uh, uh, collaborated with uh, some of our dermatologists for some skin biopsies, um, uh, utilizing a local anesthetic, um, uh, but, but having the, the child sort of anxiolized uh, to moderately sedated um, under nitrous oxide. And it is a, a, an agent that has um, a variable concentration with some delivery devices. Some, uh, some delivery devices are set at 50% nitrous oxide, 50%. Uh, oxygen, but but uh, but with the variable um, uh, titratable uh, uh, concentration range, you can go up to seventy percent and, and achieve a, a pretty reasonable degree of of uh, anxiolysis, maybe some analgesia, and uh, and that desirable euphoria. Um, and the beauty of it is, if that's what you're looking for, and your kid is uh, properly, or your patient rather, I guess adults could do this too. But if you've chosen the right patient and the right procedural indication, the the recovery is almost instantaneous, right? So you deliver it through the procedure, um, the procedure gets done, you, uh, you provide 100% uh, oxygen flow for around three to five minutes to wash out um, any lingering uh, nitrous oxide, and then stick a popsicle in their mouth, uh, presumably a pediatric mouth. I don't know what you adults do uh, post-procedurally, post um, but, but patients recover quite nicely to baseline rather quickly. Um, so, it, so it's very, very nice on the back end, um, but, it, but it does require some, either some, some knob turning or some button pushing. Um, and so it's not, uh, it, to, to render a state that's not really sufficient for like forearm fracture reduction or, or um, big joint dislocation. But it is nice for some, for some less um, noxious procedures or uh, if you use some other agents in combination, um, you, you, can, you can accomplish a pretty reasonable degree of, of, uh, of, of sedation and, um, and it can really facilitate procedural success. I think one of the uh, barriers that uh, we have, at least in the pediatric population, to uh, nitrous oxide administration um, is just the mask itself, so the delivery device. Um, we actually have um, nitrous oxide plumbed into uh, all of our rooms in our uh, new pediatric hospital, um, so it's nice to not have to have the entire setup wheeled in. Um, it still takes some finagling, but really, you know, I think selecting the appropriate patient, which of course is like the theme of this whole podcast, <laughs> right? Selecting the correct uh, agent for the appropriate patient, but selecting the patient that um, is going to benefit from it and, and really is going to tolerate the mask, I think is, is sometimes the most challenging um, leap that we have to take. Um, I've actually been really surprised patients that don't tolerate it and patients that do tolerate it, you know, really young. I've had some developmentally delayed kids that, you know, we wanted to uh, replace, a, um, you know, a G-tube and um, that just uh, otherwise are not going to, won't tolerate an IV, like yeah. hard sticks, tried this, you know, just as a sort of last ditch effort, went fabulously, hmm. almost unexpectedly so. Um, that just were able to hold the mask for whatever reason. So we, the masks that we have uh, cover the nose and the mouth. Um, if you go to a dentist's office, obviously they have to work inside the mouth. So they have like these special, um, intra, like not intranasal, but it just like covers the nose. 
uh, device, which is which is neat and you know maybe down the pipeline. But I think it's a um, it's a nice opportunity in adults. Mm -hmm. You know, if we were to work this into our um, sedation workflow, have you know our own nitrous oxide delivery system, because adults is just like, hey, put this mask on, you're gonna feel funny yeah. from it. How many are gonna you know tolerate that? The vast majority sure, sure. of of our patients, and we still have developmentally delayed adults too, yeah. that you know um, may not tolerate it. Yeah. So um, I've been surprised um, in either direction, um, who tolerates the mask and, and and who doesn't. But the agent itself, I've had amazing success with, and the patients that did tolerate it, quick on, quick off, do the procedure usually in conjunction with some other medication too. You know, it's multimodal uh, sort of angiolysis analgesia component to it. Um, and I've had great success with it and I've really enjoyed using it. I will say that uh, with nitrous oxide, you want to make uh, sure a few things aren't present. And most of these aren't going to be present in anybody you're considering doing uh, procedural sedation on. But, uh, but procedural sedation with nitrous oxide should not be given to any patient with um, with like a, a space occupying uh, or, or a, I should say like uh, a spaces in their body that, that could, could expand um, when gases uh, enter them. So uh, nitrous oxide will diffuse across um, various surfaces. And so like a recent craniotomy, a small bowel obstruction, a pneumothorax, those would all be things that you uh, would, would want to know about, of course, and not administer to your patients. Similarly, like a recent globe surgery, um, uh, thing, things of that sort. Um, and then uh, it, it interestingly is contraindicated for the first couple of uh, trimesters of pregnancy, but um, but in the third trimester, it's actually being used to facilitate some um, some deliveries uh, to make them uh, less less uh, uh, painful and, and and less distressful. So uh, again, well beyond the scope of this uh, of this discussion, but but um, but things to know about if you if you have a parent who's going to be staying in the room, you want to make sure that the parent. Uh, uh, the nurse or yourself administering the, the drug, uh, particularly uh, your patient if it's a if it's a menstruating female, um, that to to ensure that that, uh, that no one's pregnant um, in uh, in exposure to that. Um, also, uh, uh, patients with um, with known uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, the rare patient who may have recently had some bleomycin, um, mm -hmm. and patient yeah. with known yeah, remember that uh, <laughs> patient with known uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, um, nitrous oxide can, can pose some problems. All right, guys, so we're getting ready to wrap this up, and I just want to talk about just going through the procedure itself and just really highlighting, again, when you titrate, what are you monitoring, what are the different things you're looking at when it comes to actually doing your procedure station, and then we'll close off with some complications and any cool cases you guys have seen. Um, so oftentimes for vital sign arrangements, just sort of starting there, most of the time I'm actually not doing anything mm -hmm. just staying there and watching a transient hypotension with propofol as you know mild hypotension to be expected um i know that atomidate can cause some bradycardia i personally haven't seen that um and of course at the same time going through my head what is going to happen if this doesn't get better right what is my plan having a step-by-step -step, and again logistically spatially thinking in my mind where is the push dose phenylephrine, the push dose epi, um, where is, you know, where is my bag valve mask? What's my peak valve set to, you know, having all these things sort of in my mind at least and considering uh, a, res a resuscitation as well as stopping the procedure, right? Which is also sometimes a cognitive challenge to say, listen, we're stopping this reduction. We're stopping this whatever procedure that we're doing. The patient's sedation is not going well, and that's what I need to focus my attention on. And you're going to stop molding your splint now. Yeah. You know, um, ketamine with the uh, hypertension and tachycardia. I'm almost never doing anything about that because it's I've selected the patient appropriately, yeah. not someone with severe coronary artery disease who has you know an ASA score of a million. <laughs> um, you know, and um, sort of other, really the main thing for me is the ventilation. Yeah. Oxygenation there, I'm, I'm fine with giving, you know, as long as we have entitled CO2, I'm fine with giving, um, you know, some additional supplemental oxygen just at a baseline, I think is always a good idea just to sort of have that denitrogenation, the nitrogen washout, um, almost like pre-oxygenation like we do with uh, rapid sequence uh, intubation, but um, making sure that the ventilations are uh, being monitored. There have been some sedations that I've uh, had in the past where um, halfway through the procedure, I realized we don't have any capnometry. 
And that's whenever I stop everything and I just totally focus on watching the chest rise, you know, getting down to the level of the patient and really that's my focus um, because that's like the most likely uh, adverse effect in, at that point and, you know, the one that I want to act on uh, most quickly. Um, so there have been some, you know, unfortunate moments where I guess it is fortunate that nothing bad happened, but I noticed it and, you know, made a kind of like a mental sort of check for, hey, next time we got to 100% have that, you know, and that's probably why checklists are a good idea. Yeah, sure. Because how many sedations have I done in my life? Hundreds yeah. with ketamine, with propofol, hundreds. And I still, you know, occasionally will forget something. And so, um, you know, I think it's anything that we can do to cognitively offload that sort of step I think is, you know, having a second, a peripheral brain, you know, is, is crucial. Yeah, and I will say, if, uh, if you have um, uh, depression of either respiratory or cardiovascular status, um, sometimes actually doing something to the patient is the intervention that's needed, right? Not necessarily like resuscitating the patient, but if you have an orthopedist standing nearby, mm-hmm. have them wrench on the bone, yeah. have them do something that's really uh, uh, stimulating and, and noxious to the patient to promote uh, uh, respiration, to, you know, to raise that blood pressure. Um, and, and of course, uh, hopefully this is a, a transient phenomenon, as Quinn mentioned, but, but always uh, being ready to intervene um, if things get, uh, get out of hand. All right. So when you guys are going through, I just wanted to hit on a few things because I think this is something where like when you're initially starting off, you have to start monitoring, okay, when should I give some more? When should I titrate? When you guys are the person doing the actual the drug pushing, what are some things you're looking for as far as the when to go about that or is it just really time-based for you guys? Yeah, so for me, I think, especially with the ketamine, the, the, the dissociative sedations, I always try to think, is this patient actually still dissociated? Right. Because most of the time they are, and it's just their unconscious or their sort of corporeal reaction to whatever the painful procedure is, or there's no procedure, and that's already being like they just got ketamine and they're completely dissociated, and they're upset in their nightmare K-hole dream, and and you know sometimes that requires just like nothing, and it just goes away by itself, and sometimes you know a little angiolysis can go a long way. Um, a parent can never help in that situation. <laughs> um, you know, holding their hand and speaking to them can never help because they're in outer space, you know. And whether they're in the good part of outer space or bad, you know, sort of is, you know, the real question. Yeah, from a, um, from a timing standpoint, I think it's important to remember those, those durations uh, that you mentioned earlier and, uh, and just querying, are, are you in a place that this particular portion of the procedure um, and, and I guess maybe phase of the procedure, it would um, would not do the patient a disservice, right? So if you're really just sort of wrapping up the, the splint, let's say, and, and molding isn't really necessary any further, then a patient starting to moan, even if it kind of bothers your proceduralist, but you know that there's nothing really else um, painful that's coming, then you can kind of let the patient ride, even if you're kind of beyond the duration of, of, um, of action window, at least for, for optimal sedation. Uh, alternatively, it, it is helpful either to you know know this procedure because you've sedated for uh, plenty of times, or have a working relationship with your proceduralist to say, "I'm getting ready," or or asking, "Are you getting ready to mold? Are you going to do another pull? Is there anything else you need?" Because uh, sometimes it's you're, it, it's the right thing to ride, uh, let let the drug ride, let the patient ride, and just sort of like metabolize uh, the drug and, and sort of initiate recovery. Um, but sometimes you're doing your patient a disservice if you're not providing further analgesia or sedative. Um, I will say that, that there are times when, let's say, I've primarily done a ketamine sedation, nothing really is, uh, is happening um, that, that, that's painful, but the patient is becoming um, a bit more difficult to, uh, to wrangle in. I might supplement a, a little bit of uh, propofol to help sort of just chill out the patient, right? Like a, a half a milligram per kilo or maybe even a quarter milligram per kilo dose of propofol to help sort of smooth out the patient's um, sort of uh, uncontrolled activity. Um, uh, similarly, at the beginning of a, of a procedural sedation case, I may see some, some um, uh, unexpected um, myoclonus with a, with a dose of ketamine. And if uh, uh, it's likely to extinguish on its own, but if the parents haven't left the room yet, or if it's interfering with what the proceduralist needs to do, I'll, uh, I'll give a, a little dose of propofol to help uh, extinguish that. And that will also help, you know, with their um, nausea, sort of, you know, emetogenic uh, potential of ketamine. 
So we mentioned all that and going forward, and I think we mentioned a lot of this before, but I just wanted to, to highlight some of the complications of procedural sedation. I'm just gonna just recap it because I think we hit a lot, a lot of this so far. Is the big thing we're looking for is gonna be respiratory. That's gonna be the main thing that we have everyone involved with, whether it's gonna be aspiration, uh, hypoventilation, hypoxia, the, the rare chance of Lorenzo spasm, or just apnea altogether. Those are the things we're, we're looking for, and that's why we have all the equipment, all the expertise to be there. And again, our team can definitely do a good job of taking care of that, especially in the emergency department. I think there's no better place for something like this to happen, because we can really easily take care of that with no problem. Um, and then from a cardiovascular standpoint, you can have the hypotension or bradycardia, or on the other end of it, with ketamine, you can have the hypertension or tachycardia, which are again, both transient. And if you know and select the right patient, you'll be fine. Vomiting is something to be considered, Consider it up again, not something that's going to necessarily completely disrupt everything because it may not happen during the procedure. And then the emergent phenomenon with ketamine is something to be aware of. And I'm, I'm being honest, if you do some pre induction coaching, uh, you, you give some anesthesiolysis, your patient usually does well. And I think if you tell them, hey, you may see some funny stuff, you, you can be, you can you really pick your dreams. And I've had a guy who, who's getting a chest tube. And he told me he's at a cookout, and as he's seen blood, he's like, oh, catch up. Oh, wow. So you can be in a great spot when the guy's <laughs> holding his arm up by himself. Like, he's just holding the arm, and everything was fine. He's getting a chest tube placed, and he's, like, blazing out at a cookout. He's having a great time with the french fries wow. and the ketchup. That was actually his blood, and the french fries was actually the the tube going inside of him. So, again, you can put people in a good place. You just have to go from there. But... That's really the the, 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 the complications, the things to look for. Can you tell us, walk us through the one you guys, is a, a cool case you guys have had and the things to look like? Um, probably my most interesting one that I had um, was a patient who actually uh, fell off of a bike. Uh, the bike was okay, luckily. Um, <laughs> but the patient uh, had a, a distal radius fracture that needed very minimal manipulation and a complex lip laceration. Um, so we actually had two, uh, two proceduralists and I was the sedationist. And um, what we did is, as the patient was beginning to have their, um, get, get in their sedation, uh, they, we splinted the forearm and that dried, basically hardened, right? And then the lip laceration took like 45 minutes to do. That was almost nightmarish. And uh, this patient swung at me during the procedure. And that's when I realized I probably will never give the patient a weapon during the sedation with which they can attack me. Um, that actually ended up uh, requiring five mix per kick of ketamine oh, wow. and five mix per kick of propofol. Oh wow. And the patient was still swinging at me. So there was probably some super tentorial, you know, underlying issues uh, unrelated to the sedation, I think that probably um, gave rise to that, but that was, that was a lesson learned. So if you have two procedures, do the uh, one where it's not a weapon first, and then you know let them ride out with the second procedure. Oh wow! <laughs> uh, one procedure that comes to mind was actually I think uh, perhaps something that we uh, that we did well, and and maybe it would have gone fine anyway. But it was a kid, um, an unfortunate. Uh, I want to say it was an eight or nine year old kid uh, in foster care who'd been. The victim of um, of a lot of abuse in his early childhood, and um, he was in a better place, but he was involved in a lot of counseling. He had uh, a lot of um, nightmares. Uh, he had um, some behavioral challenges and uh, bedwetting, and um, uh, the he came in with a forearm fracture, which is you know he's being a kid. In addition to all the, the trauma he's endured, he, he endures, you know, a, a standard pediatric uh, uh, life event um, that involves a little bit of a uh, traumatic orthopedic injury. And so he needed uh, a fracture reduction. And and um, his, uh, uh, I think our resident picked up on this and then we, that we, we, we um, really kind of dove into his uh, behavioral challenges and, and, and the, uh, or the behavioral manifestations of, of the trauma that he had uh, endured in life prior to this and the way he's working through and making some great strides. And the last thing we wanted to do was put him in the K-hole um, exclusively and have him ha um, uh, endure a lot of maladaptive behaviors, uh, either in the immediate uh, emergence period uh, or post-discharge. Right. Um, because what we don't know uh, that a lot of patients uh, endure is what happens to them 
during right. their sleep. Right. Um, what are they having flashbacks of? Are they having procedural recall? Is it just like scrambling their brain and causing them to have uh, bad dreams? Maybe some kids have good dreams. I don't. I don't know. Um, but um, but we we um, were. You know, worked with the, the, the parents and, and kind of thought about, uh, discussed with a team um, of, of a, uh, our nurse, uh, our, I think one of our fellows, um, another attending um, who was coming on. And, um, and we gave him uh, like, a, I think either a 0.5 or a 0.25 milligram per kilo dose of ketamine, um, uh, at, which was mostly to uh, provide some subdissociative analgesia. And then he got a, um, a hematoma block um, by orthopedics um, after getting some propofol and so he was pretty much um, uh, you know anesthetized uh, distal to the, the hematoma block and tolerated the procedure really well and his uh, sedation was provided almost exclusively uh, by propofol and he woke up very very happily and of course like like most patients we we lose them to follow up in the emergency department we don't really know how they did but we did our best to uh, to try to mitigate downstream negative effects of, uh, of our drug. I would just say that uh, to this end, we really don't know what we're doing to a lot of these uh, patients, if any of these patients, when they when they leave our setting, but we know that we're scrambling their their, their brain uh, for a period of time. And it's a great privilege to be able to, to do that in a compassionate way. And so um, all this is fun. It's fun pharmacology, it's fun physiology, it's fun procedures. It's like a really rewarding part of our job to connect with patients and families in this way. But we really are manipulating them uh, in ways uh, um, that, that we don't know all of the implications uh, for, for what will um, transpire down the road. And so I would just say we should take, uh, take this charge uh, to care for patients in this way very highly and, um, and, and advocate for the optimal outcomes when, when we can best uh, affect this. And the last thing I'm just going to point out is just, I missed this earlier, was just reversal agents to have on staff, and we mentioned it before, but having naloxone and flumazone available and making sure that, again, we know exactly where those agents are, because this is the cool part. If, if you're using fentanyl and midazolam as your, your key drivers, you can reverse those agents. But I will caveat with flumazone, yeah. if you're the only, only source of GABA receptor, you know, synthetic GABA receptor antagonism, then this makes sense to do. But if there's any other, most of our adult patients, uh, we don't know what else exactly. they've had. That's right. Uh, we don't know. Again, they came in from a car accident, they have a, a shoulder reduction, and they have ETOH on board, they have a history. That's not something you want to do due to the fact that you can actually you know, cause a benzoyl resistant status of the left. Mm -hmm. And again, this is probably a board thing, and I have some people who's probably going to say, oh, Jimmy, that doesn't happen. But I wouldn't want to be in a courtroom when, when something like this occurs. Sure. Uh, so half of the job, I would say, is me, me taking care of the patient. The other half is me being the ED's lawyer. And this is one of the things <laughs> I like to make sure thank that, you. Yeah, thank I'm, you for uh, that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not encouraging the use of this solely because, oh, I gave, we, we gave benzos. Like, well, we, the patient also had, you know, a history of three months worth of alcohol abuse. We've also, they supplement with, you know, illicit Xanax and mm. things of nature that we just don't know. And we, we're yeah. not going to have the results to. And unfortunately, some of these patients, they're not going to be conscious enough to actually, you know, mm -hmm. or want to for be forthcoming, I should say, with that type of information. So right. Right. Keep, keep that in mind. But again, if you have to go that route, the dose is going to be uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 milligrams. You're going to give it like over a minute. Uh, you should see a very, very quick response. Uh, and then from there, it's going to last about 45 minutes. And then with um, naloxone or Narcan, anywhere from, again, I traditionally like to be very light with this, since we like to like 0 0.04 right. um, up front and then titrate to anywhere up to uh, 0.4 until if you're in a really bad shape, you're going to get close to right the rest up to two. Right. But again, be conscious of your many formulations that you have in your ED, whether it's going to be intranasal, intramuscular, IV, you're going to have a host of different formulations and you may have to delete this a, a, a good bit, especially for your pediatric patients, just to be able to give the dose that you want. So sure. that's my, my caveat when it comes to your, the reversal agents and um, yeah. All right, guys, we're getting ready to close this up, and I want to make sure that if you guys had any major, you know, takeaways from yourself that you, you want the audience to kind of listen to this episode and say, hey, this is the one or two things I want to, to get from this, and is there, any, you know, any caveats to the adult side versus the pediatric side, and really just kind of bring this episode home. Yeah, I think for me, the most important thing is to uh, see into the potential future. Yeah. You know, think about what is the worst possible thing that could happen? What are all the possible adverse effects and have a plan, not only a plan in your mind, but also logistically spatial awareness, 
in your mind going through, okay, this patient needs fluids. Where are the bag of fluids? Yeah. You know, where, what kind of IV do they have? Going through every step in your process and not actually doing it, but at least going through the, men the mental steps and uh, also announcing that to, mm -hmm. to the room. Hey, this patient has a borderline low blood pressure. We're giving propofol and I still think that that's the most appropriate agent. Here's what we should expect and here's what we're going to do, the steps that we're going to take if this happens. Verbalizing that out loud to the team takes so much of the stress out of the situation, a situation that already is a little bit stressful, yeah. right? Even though it's routine for us, for maybe for a new nurse or maybe for a resident or, you know, or the proceduralist, this might be a harrowing moment for them. And if you show command of the patient, the pathology, the pharmacology, if you show command knowledge of what to expect and what to do when things don't go quite as expected, um, that brings a sort of calm, not only to the room, but also you know a, an extra layer of safety to the patient whenever you're sort of treading on some potentially troublesome waters. Yeah, a couple of things I, I would add to that, I, I totally agree. Um, one is the absence of adverse events or outcomes is not uh, proof of the presence of safe practice. Yep. So patients uh, generally are quite forgiving in terms of their physiology and their tolerance of this uh, pharmacology that we're throwing at them. And uh, they may do just fine, but if we don't have the bag mag uh, bag valve mask set up, or if we don't have oxygen, or if we don't have the fluids, or we have any resuscitative equipment, or whatever we need, should the untoward event occur, um, just because no adverse event transpired, didn't mean we were uh, ready to uh, navigate and handle it if it if it were to have transpired. So, so uh, we should never grow um, complacent and overconfident that we know exactly what's going to happen and that we're the you know, best sedation provider around. Uh, the other is um, is being willing to say no. Uh, we mentioned this earlier, there's not much more I like to do than provide procedural sedation to patients because it's helping them through a, a really bad day um, and hopefully getting them uh, on the road to recovery uh, and to the rest of their life. But some patients just aren't good candidates for this. Uh, some patients are better served by our anesthesia colleagues in the operating room. Some patients, uh, it may not be um, an, a hard no, but it may, it may be a not now, right? The emergency department census or acuity uh, isn't such, or our staffing isn't such that we can take a, a um, 30 minutes or so to dedicate to a single patient when there are other high acuity or, or high volume state in the emergency department. So the willingness to say no is, a, is an important thing that, that's hard, I think. Um, and uh, to that end, sometimes saying yes creates precedent that will impact further downstream scenarios, right? So if Dr. Cummings will uh, says yes to a very complicated higher risk patient and it goes well, I don't think uh, Quinn is gonna do that, but let's say it went well or nothing bad happened. Well, the next time that scenario rolls around, that proceduralist may assume that this is just what emergency department care involves. You're willing to throw uh, ketamine or propofol at any patient that comes in the door. Yeehaw. And so uh, <laughs> somebody's gonna suffer from that down the line. Uh, the patient you know, that you thought about saying no to, but you just couldn't quite back down from, uh, from the proceduralist attending who says this is ER work, not OR work, uh, and so you acquiesce, that patient might do fine and probably will, but some patient down the road, if you keep saying yes and never hit the pause button, never say no and here's why, you're going to hurt somebody. And, um, and so you have to be willing to say, I sedate for 500 cases, uh, almost everything, all the time, every year, but 25 times a year, we might need to say no. And that's that's a pretty reasonable thing to do if you're thinking about uh, optimal patient outcomes. So, you know, well, you know, one thing I've learned is that every patient is fine until they're not. Yep. Sure. Yep. All right, guys. So I guess the, the anyone who's listening again, especially farmers, I want you guys to kind of take a, uh, take a different approach to this and look at what, what you do within these scenarios and realize there's a lot that our physician colleagues have to be aware of and ask yourself, where can you fit in? To offload some of this and build some relationships. I go to when I want to ship, I go to all procedural sedation. 
And it's just to be another person there that has the knowledge of what's going on, that has the understands the, the totality of what's going on and offload anything to do with drug medication. And where and I, I tell my nursing staff, you know, I, I may be drawing up, you may see me drawing up drugs, but the thing that I do for every scenario is the what if game. What if this goes bad? What, what what if the hypotension gets more than what can be done with, with fluid? What if all these different things? So I think understanding the right drug and the right dose, and it's understanding what's the duration and onset of these agents, and being prepared to be uh, active in case something happens. Because again, you may have two IV accesses, and one side can have the sedation and things going. But what if something else goes bad? You can get ready to hook up a bag of nitro. You can be ready to push some push dose pressors. You can be able to do these different things on the other side, and just be prepared. And I think having that there is going to be great for those those few times when things get really bad and you can make your team and you can make sure you have the best patient care outcomes by being that type of pharmacist and most of you guys who know me is the my big thing is to take it from brain to vein so literally anything that can happen you get that thing to that patient's own as soon as you can to prevent any you know abnormal things um, lastly, it's just understanding the key components of a success, successful sedation is going to be planning. And for you to have the drugs there have, and have everything done for them, even formulary decisions and your automated, automated dispense cabinets, having the right con concentrations there. And always remember, guys, especially if you're working with the pediatric, your intranasal and intramuscular routes can be used, especially in a pediatric patient. And always consider different things like regional anesthesia. Just talk to your team and figure out are there different mechanisms and you know, how come after you do it for a while, you got a few years in the game and you have, you know, a good relationship with your doctor and say, hey, this is not one of the ones you traditionally do. This is not something I, I've seen you do. I don't know if this is on your on your mind or whether it's going back and forth. Do we have the time to do this? And provide different options because as a pharmacist, again, a lot of this can be what you just saw outside of your scope. But I think if you think of yourself as a leader and a person that's part of the ED team looking at the entire process, you can be a colleague that can say, hey, um, this is something that's a little unique. I know there's a lot going on. There's, is there any other route that we can use and I can help you from a drug standpoint? Right, yeah, there's nothing nothing wrong with having just another arrow in your quiver, yeah. I think. Yeah, go from there. Well, that's all I, I have. Um, do you guys have any um, social media or anything like that that you guys want to put out for people to get in contact with you? Yeah, you can follow me um, on Twitter at recess underscore bay, B-A-E. Mm -hmm. And you can follow me on Twitter at BFJ underscore PEM, P E M underscore M D. Perfect, guys. So, of course, again, you can find all this at our, at our website, farmsoheart.com. I'm going to have a ton of resources. And if you want to get deeper into a lot of this, and I'm going to have a few courses, things built up, you can definitely visit us at the Path Q. Again, Pharmacy and Acute Care University, that's where I do a lot of my premium work and membership is going to be there. So, you can definitely catch us on that. But, of course, guys, you know how I end every single episode. You don't have to be a pharmacist. You don't have to work in an ED. But everything you do, make sure you farm so hard.